one, one, two, one, two, two, one, two, one, sorry. <laughs> Cool, so once again, thank you for being here, all of you, it's such a great honor to have you here. Um, maybe let me start with you, Mandy. Mandy, could you just tell us about a bit about yourself? I know from last time we talked, you have a lot of relations with the District 6 area, and your family has been all over. Very interesting story, but would you mind just sharing your story with us? Okay, so I don't have a direct link to District 6. Um, um, but my family comes from Claremont, Newland, um, Harfield, and so um, District 6 resonates with the stories of displacement for millions of people in South Africa. So the way we work with District 6 is merely as a case study. And so keeping the memory of District 6 alive isn't about keeping the memory of District 6 alive. It's about keeping the memory of displacement in South Africa and holding open discussions about um, um, marginalization, oppression in the world, in a sense. And so how that links to me is that um, I was a student activist in the 80s. Um, and we often found refuge in churches like the one you see that became the museum, the District 6 Museum, later on. Um, and um, in uh, our contribution to the anti-apartheid struggle as students. I was a trade unionist, and then a teacher for many years. Um, in the process of doing that, we got involved with the District Six Museum. So one of the things about the anti-apartheid struggle, it wasn't just about toy toy, it wasn't just about protest. Um, we, our generation, had no sense that we'd actually achieve liberation. And so the, 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 the very way in which we engaged in struggle was about building a new world while we dismantle the old. Mm -hmm. So while we were um, protesting, the nature of our protest was about creating spaces in which we could demonstrate that people could live together. Mm -hmm. Not just across so-called race, because we don't really, my generation, and people like me, not everybody obviously, but people like me didn't really believe, we still don't believe in the existence of race. We believe in a single human race. Um, and we believe that race is socially constructed. And so it was still relevant in a sense. But uh, we, we believe that we have to create a world and demonstrate that people can live together across race, across class, across gender, across religion. And so the nature in which when we were at high school, when we were at university, when we were um, engaging in entertainment, we were going hiking, we were starting film clubs, book clubs, no matter what we were doing, every act of bringing people together across those lines of division was an act of revolution for us. So that was basically my connection. And District 6 um, Museum, the space that was the Central Methodist Church, was a space that we shaped during the anti-apartheid struggle. So that's basically my kind of connection to the, it's not a family connection, but of course the stories resonate with me, the story of my family. Uh, the last point is, I'm the first generation in a sense born into apartheid. So my older brothers, my father, mother, and obviously grandparents, uncles and aunts, they all experience at some point in their life the impact of apartheid. At some point they were told they can't go to this beach, they can't go to that beach, they can't go and study here. An uncle of mine who was an engineer, at some point in life he just couldn't practice it anymore because he was not white. And so I, my generation, I'm 55 now, we did not experience that because we were born into apartheid. So we didn't experience a loss, um, but we were the ones who experienced the marginalization. Mm -hmm. So we never ever knew what it was like to go to Camps Bay Beach, for instance, or Musenberg Beach, whereas my father and mother had stories of fishing there or swimming there. So we experienced um, marginalization and anger in a sense. Um, 
I started high school in 76. And so you can imagine that was, and I ended high school 1980, which was mass boycott. Yeah, we boycotted my final school year, we boycotted for like six months. Um, but that was the year of mass mobilization. So I think a lot of that influenced me. Sure. And some of my best friends became Christian. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, sharing that. Um, and uh, maybe to you, John, um, I've also heard a bit of your story. We have, we have good friends. Um, can you just share a bit of that and maybe um, the focus on what made you start to see Pampano as well? I think that's been a very interesting story. Yeah, so um, I think so, so my story is obviously very different to Mandy's story. Um, although I was also born into apartheid, when you're saying that, I realized that was normal for me. Um, and even though I had something of a different story, I think, to maybe many white people, because I got involved in an organization called Script Union when I was in high school. And I, to this day, I don't know how they did it, but we had multiracial camps. Um, and so what happened is that many, many of, of the people who shaped me, um, in fact, many of the, the, the young men who became very influential in my life. I, you know, I, I came from a, my family is quite dysfunctional. Um, so I didn't really have good role models there. Um, but on, on Script Union camps, I found people I could look up to and I could respect. It. And the amazing thing is, is most of them weren't white. In fact, the majority of them weren't white. And so I found that, that, that shaping and changing me. Um, and uh, the people I looked up to, the people I wanted to be like, weren't, weren't like me. Um, I didn't realize that, I, in fact, just thinking about District 6, I actually remember uh, vividly doing, uh, do, uh, doing like singing, uh, clop, clop was the rhythm of District 6. I won't sing it, please. So. I can't even dance it very nicely, but um, I remember doing that, I remember seeing those songs, I remember being exposed to that. Um, but an interesting thing happened in my life, I think, that, and so I was exposed to that world, and, and, and I, I, some of my best friends growing up were, were different to me, were coloured and black. Um, but then, as I got more and more serious about my Christian faith, um, it's interesting watching the, the video, actually, because I realised watching the video, is that my church and my church tradition and my church experience is not represented up there. Um, I, I, was, I am an evangelical Christian. Um, I've been involved in, in many evangelical churches. Um, and what I was told that I'm more and more serious about my Christian faith is that we don't get involved in politics. Uh, we, 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 all that's important is that we tell people about Jesus. We tell people the gospel and we don't get involved in politics. Um, and, um, and I just want to say, I do believe it's important to tell people about Jesus before anyone gets upset. I absolutely, but I also believe that that doesn't exist outside of context. We can, we, we can never be acontextual. We can never be above where we live and what we do. And I don't think the Bible intends us to be. Um, and so it's part of that grappling. And I think over the last 10, 15 years, I think God has really been stirring my heart and asking questions of justice and, and asking questions about our history and, and being forced to face my own history of actually silence, of, of, of allowing a silence towards the end of apartheid um, and, um, and, and, even, um, and even into the New Dispensation saying, we're, we're silent, we, we don't have anything to say. Um, and as I read the Bible, we challenged and going, actually, I don't think that's biblical. I think the Bible has a lot to say about politics. The Bible has a lot to say about justice, a lot to say about mercy. And so for part of that has been saying, how do we, how do we bring that together? Uh, one of the things that has frustrated me as I've been involved in justice conversations, as I've been involved in justice movements, particularly around the church, uh, throughout the city, is, is always going, where is where's people from my theological camp? Where are the people that represent the churches that I'm a part of? And too often it's been very few, and I'm going to be generous there. We're, and sometimes a, a grappling and a, and a struggling with some of the theolo theology I'm hearing and the theological positions, and I'm going, well, I'm learning so much, and I'm, in, and I'm, I'm being inspired, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm being challenged by so much of what these people are saying, but I, I can't go with them everywhere on the, the, theology. Who, who, where are the leaders leading me? Where are the leaders who are coming from, from, from my churches and, and leading me and helping me think through and say, yo, we can learn from them, but here's, here's how our theology speaks to them. And I just, I found it lacking. And so I experienced almost a double frustration. A frustration going, well, where, where are, if I can say my people, and I don't want to put that too narrow boxes around that. And so I say, where, where are the people who belong to my churches? And how 
deal with this theology and unruh? And so, so really that's where, um, where Spambana was born from, is saying, well, if I'm saying, where are they? I thought God was saying, where are you? <laughs> and uh, so I went on a long process of talking and consulting and asking lots of questions and really saying to my friends, do you, do you think I'm, I'm a man? I'm, I'm a, this is what we should do. And um, the overwhelming response was just coming back and going, we, we think this is what God is calling you to do. Um, and so I was kind of terrified, but I felt in the corner. <laughs> I was like, well, I went and asked people what they thought and they all said we should do it. And so I got a group of people together and we started praying and dreaming about what Ispamana could be. Um, an organization that says, what do it mean to have cross-centered justice, holding, um, holding the cross, the centrality of the gospel and context together? How do we work that out? What does that look like? Um, and what does that look like in this place and this time? Thanks so much. Uh, and your website has got so many good resources, so do check that out. Um, so Mandy, we just watched this film, which, which was very encouraging for us from a Christian background. But this obviously just gives us more snippets into what apartheid entailed, what the forced removals entailed. So for those of us who are here, who actually are oblivious to what happened in the history of South Africa, do you want to give us a quick rundown of what apartheid was, what, which, is, which, is, which is a big topic, which will take like forever. But. <laughs> I hope you guys listen. <laughs> um, no, I won't. Uh, but just a quick rundown, and the move us that we are all on the same page. Okay, uh, luckily I've um, had a bit of practice uh, in the last few weeks because we do this project called um, Tell Your Story to a Born Free, inverted commons, mm -hmm. where we engage you with people who actually lived during apartheid and encouraging mm -hmm. them to have conversations with younger people. And one of the things that's interesting that comes out of that, and also that comes out of the work we do at the District 6 Museum, which is mainly oral history, is that you don't get the grand narrative of apartheid. Um, most of what people hear about apartheid is that you have this horrible white uh, oppressor, and they oppress all shades of black people, and people like Nelson Mandela then liberated us. And since our liberation, the story of apartheid really become about the experience of people like Nelson Mandela, about the experience of political prisoners. Now, I don't want to diss that because I was also a political prisoner, so I'm not saying those stories are not important. But I think the experience of apartheid in the everyday, you know, how it affected people in the everyday in terms of uh, um, the fact that people, every single citizen, and non-citizen had to be racially classified by law. And I think people often think about apartheid as being the separation of white people and black people. But apartheid was actually a very systematic uh, process of dividing black people up into a range of manufactured tribal and racial identities. So we had, uh, for instance, uh, the great majority of people in South Africa were made non-citizens, but this precedes apartheid. This is, uh, comes from bef um, during the colonial period in, with the 1913 Native Land Act, where people who were Kosa, Zulu, Sutu, Tswana, Pedi, etc., speaking what, what today people talk about as Black African. I'm not comfortable with that term, but in any case. Um, the great majority of people were declared non-citizens and had to live in something like 7% of the land and that's become even, sorry, 13% of the land. Um, the rest of the country became, you know, overnight, uh, became part of 7% of the population. Um, or they had uh, something like 13 uh, percent legally, but eventually up to seven percent got to had the right to own that land. Um, so we need to understand apartheid in the context of the colonial history, because that's the roots of it. Um, when apartheid comes in 1948, often what people don't link it to is that the followers of Hitler actually win the elections in 1948 here. Yeah. So while Hitler's defeat 
defeated in Europe, his followers who fight on the side of Hitler in the Second World War in, in organizations like the Osova Brandtag, they mobilize around issues of white identity. They mobilize the poor white population in a very similar way to which Trump is mobilizing people in the poor, poor whites in the United States. And on the basis of using white identity politics, a white supremacist government comes into power. And so apartheid becomes about white supremacy. It becomes about um, changing the education system, the, what they preach in churches. So by law, they start preaching that apartheid is a God-given right. Mm. That white supremacy is it's in the Bible. They preach it in church. Mm. If you speak to a lot of like die or apartheid people today, they still believe in the superiority of the white race. And it's it's making a huge comeback uh, in the world today. The idea, and there are scientific statistics, they use empirical evidence to prove who took science around the world. So colonialism becomes proof and evidence of white superiority. And so we must understand, first of all, that apartheid is a system that's based on um, a religious concept in that framework of what is called Christian national education or Christian nationalism. But so part it was a system of Christian nationalism. It was also socialist, <laughs> national socialist, in the sense that um, it was a belief that the government should make sure that people who have been classified white get good education, get access to health, get access to clean services, all the things that people have privatized today during a part that was considered to be a political right, but not for all, for white people. So this, uh, there was a rapid growth in schools, in hospitals, in uh, public transport, in the uh, service uh, economy, a huge growth, but only for a very few people. The rest of the people were divided racially, so you had um, Africans who were non-citizens, but then black people were divided into Cape colored, other colored, it was a race other colored, mm -hmm. legally, um, Cape Malay, Asian, other Asian, Khrikwa, there was a black race group called Chinese, because of the indigenous uh, Chinese, sorry, the Chinese who come in as laborers. And so, um, segregation and marginalization was aimed at, um, lastly to say, from my analysis, was largely aimed at extracting the wealth of the country for a few. And the race became the way to divide and rule people. Not all white people became rich. Mm. Uh, in fact, uh, we've still inherited a very, uh, not a large, but there's quite a significant section of poor white people. Um, so, I don't know, maybe questions like, because there's so much to say about what yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, and you did touch on this, but John, mm. so this uh, documentary showed uh, the church in action fighting against forced removals, um, but we also know that that's not the full picture. Um, do you want to give a quick survey of the church and how it responded um, within the era of apartheid? Um, yeah, from just yeah, from your perspective. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give a like a little slice, I think, um, and just and just really focus. I think predominantly on a on, on kind of from an evangelical. Uh, perspective, just because I think that's that's my story. That's what I know, um, and I, I find it interesting. And I always say this because I think it's the truth, and I think it, history bears this out. That apartheid was a doctrine before it was a law, um, and it was actually a missionary strategy even before it was a doctrine. So I, I just want to read you just a quote from uh, the 1857 Dutch Reformed Synod. Um, they debated this question. They debated the question as to, uh, I'll, I'll quote it, so I'm going to get it right. 
whether persons of color could be admitted as members of the sorry persons of color admitted as members of the church should be served holy communion equally with born Christians. Their words, not mine. Uh, anyway, so they, that, that 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 was the 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 the, the, the issue up for discussion this age. 1857 synod, and they discussed it, and they counter discussed it, and you know how these things go. Anyway, at the end of it, this is what they decided. They decided that though, that while it was both desirable and scriptural, you hear that? It's desirable and scriptural that our members from the heathen, again, their words, not mine, should be taken up and incorporated in our existing congregations, wherever that can be done, but where this rule, because of the weakness of some, should stand in the way of the advancement of Christ's cause amongst the heathen. Again, their rules, words. The congregations raised up or to be raised up from the heathen shall enjoy their Christian rights in a separate building or institution. So while it's both desirable and biblical, while it's what we desire and what we believe the Bible teaches, because of the weakness of some, we're going to deny a significant portion of these people who, are, who have become Christians, as we understand it, publicly brothers and sisters in the Lord, we're going to deny them their Christian rights. Now the backstory to that is very interesting, particularly if you're an evangelical like mine, because, uh, like I am, because I think what we want to do is we want to put the blame on the Dutch Reformed Church all the time. And they do have a lot to answer for, let's be honest. But we are not innocent. Because the, where this actually comes from, is it comes from the Dutch Reformed Church Synod. But what had happened is previous, earlier in the century, uh, around the, in the 1800s, they couldn't find ministers to, to, for, uh, to occupy the pulpits of the Dutch Reformed Church. So what they did is they went overseas and they got a whole bunch of evangelical. So if, if, <laughs> these are people who believe that telling people about Jesus is, is supremely important. They got a whole bunch of evangelical ministers to come over from Scotland to fill those pulpits. Okay, and, and I'm a Presbyterian, so this is pointed right at me, okay? So, and we came, and they came over, and what they did is they did what all good evangelicals do. They told people about Jesus, they encouraged them to become Christians, and do you know what happened? People became Christians. They came into the church, and suddenly you had this problem where the Dutch settlers had their understanding of Christianity that said, if you're white, you are a Christian. And actually, in fact, they'd stopped preaching the gospel to people who weren't. Uh, who who are, who are other than white because they said they were eternally damned. Now that's not even biblical, but th so that was the thing. And then you had you had these evangelicals coming along, doing what evangelicals can. Say no, the gates are open to everyone. The gospel is available to everyone. So they shared the gospel. People became Christians. They came into church. Now you had a clash, yeah, didn't you? Because if you if you allowed these other people to come into the church, you're going to divide the church. And you know what you're probably going to do is you're going to stop the mission of, of being able to tell people the gospel. So because they said it is more important that we do evangelism than the, than the people that we actually say are made in the image of God and that we are saying are part of the kingdom. Because it is more important that we can do our even evangelism work, we actually are going to make a deal with the devil so that we can do that at any cost. Even the cost of dehumanizing those that we say are loved and called by God. We made that deal. We did that. If you're an evangelical, that's our history. And I don't have to tell you how that history very quickly moves from separate buildings to separate churches to separate denominations, some of which are not yet reconciled to this day. And then apartheid, and then full-blown apartheid comes on. I, I, by the way, I believe the, the, the doctrine of apartheid, was actually, it's actually designed, it, it was a, the, the, your apartheid theologians went and they built up a theology based on the separate development theology of Dutch theologians to justify what was already happening because of evangelical missionary work. And then what we as good evangelicals said, we are apolitical. We don't get involved. We have, we have a lot to answer for. And we perpetuated this idea of apolitical spirituality, not only to the white, to, to the white congregations, but we taught the, the black evangelicals that for them to be faithful to the church, it meant that they were not involved in politics, that they were not involved in the struggle, that they were quietest. That's what we took. And so it, to speak up, to organize, to involve some of the, the organizations, it was to be unfaithful to God. And people bore that burden. And then what we, and we, we took a further, we, 
And then we villainized those who did stand up. Maybe of a different theological persuasion, maybe of a different, maybe we have some issues with their theology, and I, I can't say to agree with everything that Peter Story or Desmond Tudor's theology, but those were men and many women as well who stood up. And we ought to have learned from them, but instead we, we villainized them because they held different theological views from us. I'm not saying that we have to agree with them, but we, we ought to have learned. We ought to, our consciences ought to be pricked by them. So I, I can go on, uh, but I think I should stop. Cool. Thank you so much. That is very insightful. Um, and I think questions should come up. Questions will come up later on in regards to that. Um, but just moving along, um, it, is, it is good to look at the past and see like, what we did uh, wrong there. And it's always, I think, when, you look, when you're looking at history, it's always easier to spot the errors. It's easier to go like, oh my word, that was so bad. Uh, but when you're in uh, the current times, you're blinded to it. And maybe a hundred years from now, people look back and go like, what are these guys doing? So it's always good to introspect where we are. So Mandy, maybe just to ask you, are there any patterns from the apartheid era that we still are embracing? Or what should we watch out for such, uh, in such a way that we don't actually give back to that same place, maybe not by law, but even through just normal societal structures as well. Well, first of all, the one thing that defined a part that, that I didn't mention, which comes into this question, is was also a system of complicity. Uh, so there's no way a minority ruled a majority um, just by force. Um, there was a lot of buy-in through the churches, um, through self-hatred. So the way in which, uh, during apartheid, uh, what's this guy, Mashaba, I think, who's uh, in the Croc Brothers, where the apartheid museum is, not just the Croc Brothers, um, this famous um, uh, family who funds the apartheid museum in Soweto and that, that whole uh, fantasy park, they made the millions that out of selling uh, skin lightness. You know, and this is during a party, so the idea, um, so one of the patterns that has continued is the idea that people still believe in the existence of race as a scientific and as, an, uh, as a, um, a concept that can be proven through empirical evidence of, of showing that because so many people who happen to be blonde, blue-eyed, or because so many Jewish people have Nobel Peace Prizes, therefore there has to be some kind of superiority, natural superiority in the DNA of people. Now, of course, I'm not going to go into how that's been debunked uh, by so many uh, scientists over the years, but that being whether it's debunked scientifically is not the issue. The point in popular discourse, people believe it. Some act on it, they form organizations to support the idea of white supremacy, others through the kind of embracing intrinsically of that belief in how they accept and become complicit and through their silence in the oppression of others show that the patterns have continued. So for instance, um, one of the reasons why the story of District 6 remains um, uh, still alive today is that forced removals continues. People are being evicted every single day. So the idea of cleansing a city, of cleaning a city, the idea of seeing human beings as vermin because they're poor, because they're unemployed, because they don't have jobs, that idea is a very uh, deep idea that still exists. Um, fascism is not an event. And if we look at the, 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 the amount of violence, I mean, raping of children, the way we treat animals in this country, we can see that the fascist pattern, the idea of exerting your superiority through force and violence, is something that people believe is common sense. You know, if your wife doesn't agree with you, we just slap her. 
And you often hear how people talk in those ways in cars. So I think one of the big patterns that continues is this idea that uh, oppression, marginalization is only kept in place by those in power. And it's not to the idea of how people in the everyday are complicit in that. And so I think that it's incumbent on us to examine our way of engaging with fellow human beings, not just when we in workshops and talk about racism, or when we in workshops we talk about decolonizing. So I often fight with fees must fall students uh, who are in our programs, and the roads must fall, etc. and the decolonizing uh, movement who I fully support. But I often fight with them because I say, okay, once you get out of your protest, what are your patterns of uh, humanity? Right? How do you treat that person who's cleaning the toilet or that person who's collecting the dirt? Um, and substitute that with the way in which people who by law were given more rights as whites treated people who were cleaning the gardens, cleaning the kitchens. You know, it's no different. It's absolutely no different. The fact that we don't, we have a, a wonderful constitution doesn't change the fact that South Africans haven't changed their behavior in terms of how we see each other. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, another pattern, the final, I think there are a whole range of patterns that have continued and they all link. But I think the, 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 something that I'm sure all of you experience, are you all from Cape Town? No. Oh, oops. <laughs> are you, but you're all from South Africa? Oh, yeah. They broke into my place so many times, eventually I, got, I, I gave up my license and I joined the security WhatsApp <laughs> with a crow bomb came a month ago, broke in and stole everything. Any case, anybody who's on an anti-crime WhatsApp group will know that whenever a person who's dark skin walks down the street, mm. then you just hear ping, 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 you know? Um, and so often what I do, because Woodstock has changed quite a bit recently, so you get a lot of evangelicals who are moving in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of happy clapping, white churches, are influenced by the Americans, they move, and they, so the street I live in is virtually an evangelical street. And so now they a new, a new trend has started. That on Sunday morning, for the first all these used to be Nigerians, Ghanaians, um, local South Africans of all shades walking up the street, coming from church. Now suddenly you see these white happy clappy families <laughs> walking up the street. So now I start what's happening. <laughs> Not. 
Some people belong because of wealth and how they present themselves. Some people belong because of accent. So at UCT, I mean, I work with a lot of students who didn't go to Model C schools. So they still speak like Ikasi, whether it's Langa, Gooks, or Mitzel's plane. And the plan of our time, The mere fact that they speak like that, there are all kinds of judgments made about intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, inadvertently we're holding in place the very patterns that oppress us in apartheid. And uh, people are finding ways to assimilate into what they consider to be power. And that's accent, it's colors, lightening your skin, it's you know, not going into the sun. Um, if you don't use chemicals, I think those patterns, but the biggest pattern is the pattern of exploitation, the fact that some people believe they have a right to pay people below a living wage. So they believe they still have a right to have a domestic worker at slave wages, you know, where they should be doing that work on their own. And they see it as a duty, they're employing people. So I think all those things are dehumanizing others. Continue. Sorry for the. No, keep going. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, where are you guys at? Well, um, thank you for that. I am Jordan. I live in Um I don't walk down your street. Okay, so Jordan, just to end off. Um, so, from a more theological perspective, hmm. do you think, as the church, currently, we have learned from our past? mistakes. Maybe similarly to a question I asked Mandy in terms of patterns and what do you, if, if you think we haven't, well there's some patterns that we're still adopting that are not right, what do you think is the right way forward to actually address those patterns? So, no, it's probably my, the, the general answer. I, I, I'm not sure we have. Um, I'll give you an example for, I've, I've been reading a lot of submissions to the, to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and I just focused on particularly overtly evangelical churches for instance. And I looked at that and I saw a lot of people talking about all sorts of reasons why they had been silent and complicit and uh, failed in apartheid. And most of them had to do around, uh, we, we were scared, we believed the government propaganda, uh, we uh, we didn't know what to do. All, all sorts of and legitimate reasons, but I saw very little self-reflection and going, how did our theology, how did our good evangelical theology allow District Six to happen? How, how did how did we go to church and hear about Jesus? I loved what uh, one of the guys said there. What are my colleagues saying to in their churches about what love is? And I was like, what gospel will we be preaching? What is this theology we were talking about that allowed the mass dehumanization to happen? That we allowed us, you can say we allowed ourselves to be used, both black and white, to support white supremacy? And so when I look at that, I say, have we done that hard work? Let, let's not fool ourselves. Apartheid was an intentional, deliberate, and intensely evil, but brilliant. I mean, we, we fool ourselves if we think the architects of apartheid were stupid. They were, they were evil geniuses, I think Trevor Noah says. And I think it's true. Because we we're like 20 odd, I can't do my maths anymore, to a lot, 20 lot of years after apartheid is off the statute books. And we are still living with the effects. It lives on in all the things Mandy said. It's still living on. The spirit of apartheid is alive and well. And it was intentional, it was deliberate, it was systematic, and it, it was done with a, a, a brilliance that is chilling. And if we think, by just giving people votes, throwing open our church doors, singing Kumbaya, Nelson Mandela wearing uh, rugby shirts or soccer shirts or, or whatever, then things are going to be okay, we're kidding ourselves. And I think we've done that in the church too often. We've thought, hey, things are different. We, we've got black people in our church. Mm. So, some of my favorite small group leaders are black. I don't know, whatever. We, we talk, but have we examined our systems and our structures? Because let's, let's also not fool ourselves into thinking, and I, I think this is sometimes we do. We say, we were the church, we were about spiritual things. So we were not as affected by the, the, the contents. Friends, apartheid 
was so systematic and so brilliant that none of us got out alive. It's because none of us got out alive. It's why I don't buy the colorblind ratio. I can be very sarcastic, my wife tells me, to, but I, whenever someone tells me they're colorblind, I kind of want to go shake up their hand and go, wow, amazing. You're, you're the one. You, you are the one. The rest of us were intensely messed up by apartheid, but you got out alive. You survived. Well done. Because I can't help but see color. I have been trained by it. I've been shaped by it. It's the, it was the air I breathed. It still is. It's the, it's the water I swim in. I've been trained to be a white supremacist, friends. And, and, and that doesn't just go away. And, and let's remember the opposite of white, the flip side of white supremacy is black inferiority. So in a sense, all of us have been trained in this. And unless we intentionally and deliberately examine our systems and our practices and our own hearts and our own attitudes and daily, and as Christians we take it to the cross and we, 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 we let it die there and, we, and we, we learn and we grow, unless we do that, we, we will continue with those patterns. They will not just disappear. It will not just disappear. So, um, thank you so much. Um, Thank you once again to Mandy and John. I, I do know this is like a quick taste.